Hello, guys. How are you? Hope everybody is in the meeting. And I can see a participant still now. Um, so today we will be talking about uh, two cases. One will be uh, with me and the other will be with Dr. Kuzma. So uh, it will be like uh, uh, the cases uh, which usually comes in OSCE and these are uh, like in the form of a structured discussion and it can, it can be one of the simulated patient's task. So, uh, so right now, um, the one case will be discussed by me and the other case will be discussed by Dr. Uzma Ali. And uh, we will be discussing two cases which have recently come in the recent March 2022 OSCE exam. Um, for uh, starting our session, I would really want two volunteers uh, who can start up uh, as a candidate uh, so that we can uh, streamline and begin our session. So is there any volunteer who would like to go for the first case? Anybody uh, who can volunteer for the first case? And that would be a very happy experience for you guys. Kalda Salim or uh, Artika. Any, anybody who can volunteer? I think this is really going to be a you know, um, a good experience if you if you present the case, though you you may might uh, make mistakes, but it really is going to help you out when we will be taking out mistakes of you so that you can learn from that what actually uh, we do it nervously and when we don't know exactly when the unseen stations come. And this is how you can, you know, not forget if we take out your mistakes at the same time. So anybody who wants to volunteer, it's uh, Dr. Pritika. Are you there? Muna Muhammad, Nurun, Zinubia. Anybody who would like to go for? Hello, hello. Guys, please. Otherwise, I'm going to pick it myself. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Asma. Yeah, who's that? I'm Dr. Khalda. Dr. Khalda. How are you, Dr. Khalda? Fine, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, uh, you have, can you introduce yourself a bit so that we can know about you? Um, um, actually, I am from Saudi, I'm from Pakistan, currently living and working in Saudi Arabia. Um, okay. I have just cleared my, I have a diploma in Obigaini from Pakistan. Uh, then I have uh, done my MRCOG just now in Feb. I cleared my MRCOG. Actually, I cleared my part two in July 2019, but due to COVID situation, could not get the seat. So, but Alhamdulillah, this time I cleared my MRCOG uh, in Feb. And uh, just a few days before, on 15, the MRCPI part two written exam also I cleared. Okay, that's wonderful. So now you're left with Oski, right? I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, that's uh, congratulations first on the success of your MRCOG exam. Uh, it was you. a really tough job and you made it clear, wonderful. Uh, so right now, uh, this would be a very good experience for you to go ahead for the MRC Yoski because you would have uh, you know, idea regarding the, what kind of uh, stations that usually comes in OSCE. Uh, so the similar kind of stations are really going to come in the MRC Yoski, but this the style is like this. This is more likely to be a more structured discussion as compared to the more of the uh, simulated patients, which usually okay. we encounter in MRC. So uh, okay. for the first station, I'm going mm -hmm. to show you. We have to take uh, two minutes. Uh, but uh, tell you, Halda, that uh, uh, it's not like MRCOG. Uh, it's just that uh, if you've given a uh, diploma, if you've done it, uh, uh, this, what, ha what have you done from Pakistan, DGO or is it MCPS? DGO, DGO. It was in 2002, long time. 
Oh, okay, okay. So usually it's, uh, you know, a slight similar pattern the way we have uh, in our Pakistani exam and most of the other exams like other countries do. So they have one long case uh, that mm -hmm. is uh, that comes and uh, mm -hmm. it has 50% carriage of passing marks uh, once you prepare for your OSCE exam. And uh, then the 50% are for the eight stations with, uh, out of which seven are the structure discussions and one station is the role player station. And uh, there is total 10 minute time for each of the station, including those two minute time of reading. Okay, the way you used to have in your MRC or Gioski exam, it was two minutes mm -hmm. outside the cubicle and then 10 minutes you used to have with the patient. But here in uh, MRC Gioski, everything is included in 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, okay. Okay, so, uh, Let's start so that uh, the rest of the candidates would also have an idea that how this exam usually comes and why, how the examiner uh, deals with the candidate, how the candidate has to approach the station. Okay. So okay. can you see my screen? Uh, I can speak loudly. You want me to speak loudly? Can you see my screen, Halda? Yes, I can see. Okay. So please, uh, uh, I'm just starting your timer. Let me just. Uh, the station the timer for you. Okay, so I'm starting your timer. Just take a read, and uh, once you're read your station, you make up your mind. Then you just uh, you can say that I uh, you can start, and then I can start giving you questions. Okay. Okay. So start. So your time has already been started. Okay. We have only one slide or we have other slides? Yeah, there? only one slide. So are you ready for discussion, Khalda? Yeah, let us start. Maybe so, I don't know much things, but let us start. Okay, so you can have a try. So what initial assessment for this patient you're gonna go for initially? Uh, yeah, um, first of all, I will uh, introduce myself to the patient and ask the patient uh, identification. And then I will take a, um, after uh, making her comfortable and uh, making her calm, I will talk, take a history from my patient about the situation, about what happened, where it happened, and how it happened, and who was the involved culprit, whether they were known to her or uh, they were not known to her, what was, uh, whether she can identify what was their nationality, what uh, ethnicity actually, and uh, when it happened. And then uh, I would like to know that uh, uh, the rape has been happened. So, what type of uh, whether it's a uh, what type of intercourse it has been uh, um, about the uh, what, uh, what whether it's a vaginal oral or a, uh, anal intercourse and uh, when it happened exactly. Then I would like to know about her uh, uh, whether it was her known. Uh, it was uh, if she has been raped. Then I would like to know about her uh, the the persons known to her or not known to her. Uh, like I will take a detailed history from about the incident of the rape. Then after that, I would like to know about her menstrual cycle history. That uh, what currently what type what uh, uh, manage, what uh, what stage of menstrual cycle she is, whether she is using any contraception before or not. Uh, she was sexually active before or not. She has any regular. She was having any regular sexual partner or not. Then after that, after taking the menstrual cycle history and the contraception history, I would like to know about her any past history of sexually transmitted infections as well. I would like to take a history about uh, her, um, uh, uh, any, uh, I would like to know about her history of any current complaint apart from the rape that she had any vaginal bleeding, any uh, discharge, any pain, any scratch marks, anything like this for which she need immediate uh, treatment. I would like to know about her uh, after taking menstrual cycle history, these history, I would learn my next step in the history will be her taking detailed history of her um, uh, um, her obstetrical history. 
her uh, medical history, whether she has any other comorbidities or not. Her, uh, her I would like to know about her. First of all, the, the most important is her age as well. And then I would like to know about her um, uh, surgical history, family history, her medication history, any known drug allergies, her, uh, um, uh, uh, her social circumstances, her personal history, how is support at home, where she is living, how is uh, the things around her and uh, um, uh, according to her age, whether she is a student or a school going children or whether she is a, um, she is a, an adult person. Uh, I would like to know about her social history, smoking and alcohol and any recreational drugs, particularly about any alcohol intake in this case, because maybe the patient is intoxicated at that time or uh, um, she has been, uh, she doesn't, she knows about it. Uh, about whole situation or not. Alcohol and drinking history is important here for me. And after taking the history from my patient, I would like to, um, in the presence of a chaperone, we would like to examine her. Uh, although in uh, Irish uh, system, I think it's this, that uh, uh, patient, should be, patient should be seen by the uh, patient. Uh, if patient present to you, we should refer the patient immediately to the SAR or involve the forensic team. And we will uh, examine the patient. We will take examine the patient and uh, uh, it, uh, doing all examination, looking for any abrasions, any injury marks. Then uh, we will take okay. the um, samples from the different sites where intercourse has taken place. And depending upon the how much time has elapsed between the uh, between the sexual intercourse and the uh, uh, sexual intercourse and the web um, presentation. Okay. And uh, what do you think is the chain of evidence and how are you going to maintain the chain of evidence throughout your collection of samples for the patient? Yeah, chain of evidence is very important because uh, maybe the patient is not right now interested in uh, reporting to the police, but sometime if later she changes her mind. So this is important. Chain of evidence include all the uh, history of the patient, incident history, and then examination include all the important examination points of any his injury. Uh, to the uh, any in, uh, any injury marks like any abrasions uh, and if there is any injury marks we should look for the color the depth of the injury the uh, size and the um, uh, any um, uh, type of injury then after that we have to uh, take the swaps from the patient uh, to collect to swaps from the it depends upon if it is uh, from the vagina we can take for seven days from the mouth if I'm not wrong we can take for uh, two days and NL we can take up to three days after intercourse. Urine should be collected and uh, any evidence uh, which the pair and uh, this evidence should be collected in the form of um, uh, description as well. And uh, if possible, and the forensic team is available, we can take the photograph all with the permission of the patient as well to um, keep the record in the patient. All examination is swabs and uh, we should take the high vaginal swabs for any infections and um, uh, this, uh, with, these all should be taken from the patient. Okay. And uh, so just... Uh, Is there any more questions? Yeah, there are some questions. It's actually the, the problem with my slide. Okay, so... How are you going to involve the team to deal with this patient? And how are you yeah. going to manage this patient? Uh, we are going to involve uh, the team to deal with this patient. Uh, we should involve the uh, sexual assault uh, referral center in this patient as well, who are very specialized in involved in dealing with the patient, where the all kind of support can be provided to the patient, not only the medical support, but forensic evidence support, psychological support, as well as the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, police support and all the support can be provided to this patient. So definitely in with the involvement of my consultant, the SARC referral, so sexual assault referral center team should be involved to manage this patient, to collect all the evidence and to keep the chain of evidence and to further manage this patient. Now, regarding the management of this patient, if I would like to know uh, the, the management involved, the immediate management of the patient, if the patient is in pain, after ruling out the drug allergy, we should provide her any medication of the pain. 
our symptomatic treatment should be provided. High vaginal swab should be taken for the SS and uh, then patient should be provided with a uh, post-exposure prophylaxis uh, for the uh, HIV. Uh, regarding the vaccination status patient, if hepatitis B vaccination is not up to date, patient can be provided with hepatitis B vaccination as well. Regarding the pregnancy, we should provide the emergency contraception uh, to the patient uh, depending on which stage of the cycle is whether the oral pills can be provided or uh, IUCD, copper IUCD can be provided to the patient. Along with that, um, uh, this immediately we should take the swab and uh, uh, the for uh, sexual transmitted infection prophylaxis can be started along with the HIV prophylaxis. And this patient should be called in the referral center after three weeks again, and then in three months time again to look for the, because we will take the blood samples as well. To, to look for the HIV status, hepatitis B, hepatitis C status of the patient. So if at the baseline we will take, and then again at three months, we will call this patient again to have all this prophylaxis and uh, 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 to, provide, to, check, to check again the, whether the patient has developed this um, uh, any infections. Uh, along with that, uh, we should provide the psychological support to the patient. Patient should be referred to the psychological counselor uh, to talk to him, to make her comfortable. And this uh, this reference is not only a single referral, but it should be a continuous support to the patient to, to make sure that the patient return back to her sexual uh, routine life and social life in a, uh, come, uh, in a proper way and the patient, uh, uh, patient does not get uh, uh, so much severely affected by this incident. Okay. okay, anything else you would like to add? Um, this is what right now I remember. Okay. Uh, yeah, so there's that's... one more question. It actually came in our uh, the last exam. Uh, so the examiner asked, the patient has presented to you unconsciously. So what EDs are coming into your mind when seeing this patient of sexual assault? Unconscious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If the patient is unconscious, there can be so many differential diagnoses. It can be, it can be maybe due to intoxication. Maybe she has been uh, badly hit and hidden and had trauma is there. That's why she is uh, um, uh, unconscious. It can be due to some uh, um, because she has been uh, given some medication to make her unconscious. She has uh, some, uh, maybe she has some epileptic fit or some, uh, she is non-epileptic or some fits she is having and that's why she is unconscious. Maybe she has got some medical disorder which make her unconscious. So this, these, these things comes in my mind. Epilepsy, like maybe stroke, maybe some internal bleeding, uh, severe injury, so, so trauma, intoxication, drugs. Yeah. So keeping all these things in your mind, then how are you going to plan your management? And are you going to take the samples at the same time for the forensic? No, no. no. If the patient is unconscious, we cannot take it at the same time. It should be, it should be uh, once the patient become conscious because maybe she is alcohol intoxicated, and in that case we cannot take the samples from the patient without patient permission. So in that case we will take all the samples when the patient is conscious and with her permission. So that should be knows about uh, that what is the cause of this unconsciousness and her permission is important. Okay, is there anything else you would like to add? No, right now, no. thank you. Thank okay. you for your time. Okay, so uh, the time is up and uh, these were the three more questions actually uh, the examiner asked uh, in this uh, exam uh, when it came as a structured discussion. And this is how structure started, but I uh, put it as a last uh, questions because I wanted you to go through all of the station of a sexual assault the way we should have gone through. Uh, well done, Halda, you've done everything right uh, according to MRCOG, but according to when I, when I talk about um, um, this uh, RCPI, um, there are certain things you need to change it. And for this, you need to uh, see some guideline points which are actually available in HSCs. Uh, and uh, you need to add it into your notes. Everything according for the management you've done right, uh, but the groups like um, the, uh, the support groups they are different for the Ireland. Ireland, uh, when we talk okay. about the Irish, mm -hmm. um, it's quite different from those of the you know RCOG, and it's different uh, when you talk about the involvement of the police, the police uh, department. Uh, you need you have to name it, and I'm going to explain everything in a while. So. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so well done. Um, uh, you, uh, you have not read anything, but you have completed the station in a very beautiful way. So 
Uh, here, let's, uh, let me just go through the important points. I ask you about what initial assessment you're gonna go for the patient. So this question usually involves um, the his initial history and uh, also the examination of the patient. Uh, so you rightly said that you're going to ask about uh, the patient, uh, you know, first the immediate effect through which the patient has come, for example, uh, the status of the patient, that the patient is conscious or uh, uh, unconscious, intoxicated, whether the patient is bleeding and uh, whether the patient is frightened. Uh, so I need to first check this uh, for the patient so that uh, we can see uh, that the patient can be safely approached. I need to inform my consultant regarding this immediately if the patient is unconscious or the patient is bleeding um, in order to make myself more safer uh, for the patient. We also are going to approach the patient in a more safer manner to allow her uh, so that she can give the consent for the, um, for the, for the, uh, for the samples to be taken if she is conscious. For this, we have to sensitively approach the patient regarding uh, the groups which are involved. So the prime concern for the doctor uh, is the health of the patient and satisfactory medical outcome. We'll have to check the casualty department with the protocols or gynae department protocols of the hospital internet and the casualty officers may have failed to do this. So assess the patient. Is the patient is seriously injured requiring immediate treatment? Presentation of the patient, the patient doesn't require any gynecological surgical input because patient might present with you any uh, with the history of any trauma that might involve splenic injury for this, the patient might be, you know, unconscious. So in that case, you need to uh, make a fast, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, of the patient, whether the patient is stable, and if in case the patient is not stable, then what kind of acute injuries that you might be suspecting. Yeah, you will write about your diagnosis, DDs, uh, but you need to mention about the broad ligament hematoma as well because of the sexual, you know, rape or thing like that. So it may be that you have to discuss this onto the SARC unit or the local police rape suite. So these are actually SATU. So these are sexual assessment referral uh, units which are present in um, Ireland. So you need to, instead of saying SARC, you, you can say SATU or TESLA. So TESLA are the, the, uh, the special units which are present in um, uh, this uh, island, which deals with the um, rape and uh, sexual assault uh, cases in Ireland. So if the injured uh, patient does have some minor injuries, so the recent onset, so you need to make sure that uh, uh, this, if she wants to give her head, uh, go ahead with the uh, save of the sample or she wants to give the samples. So you need to take a sample from that place and then you can save it or you can arrange for the SATU. And the people who come from the SATU, uh, like the SARC unit in MRCOG, uh, so these assigned special people and these people are called as uh, this... Um, let me tell you this. Gardai. So, so the Gardai are the special people who has been assigned a duty for detection of these samples or collection of these samples or DNA samples, which has to be collected and given back to the SATU if the patient gives consent. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, duty, uh, the Gardai uh, addresses two main issues, whether an offense was in fact committed or by whom the offense was committed. So the Gardai investigation is conducted for the single-minded objective of creating a case against a particular sub suspect. Uh, so this, when they have done the uh, investigation, so file is sent to DPCC, that is Director of Public Prosecutions. So uh, the examiner might ask you, uh, this question, because this question is more oriented towards MRCPI, is how they're going to differentiate from you. But the basic things you've done, uh, everything is right. So after this, uh, you uh, can divide uh, your station into three uh, types of questions. So the first question is where the assault has taken place and from when, who, what, and where. And what, uh, what, when, what was the last uh, menstrual period uh, she had in terms of uh, getting pregnant and uh, risk of pregnancy. So your questions need to involve last menstrual period, the cycle of the, the cycle length, any previous episodes of unprotected sexual intercourse in that cycle, previous use of hormonal emergency contraception in the cycle, any medical eligibility or drug interactions she, she might be taking. For example, if you're considering for giving her 
Ella wants. So she, you need to, uh, you need to see that she's not taking any, you know, uh, uh, this, um, uh, this is uh, put on pump inhibitors. Okay, so this reduces the action of Ella one, and your contraception is going to be missed. And what is the individual choice of the patient? So the type of sexual assault. So you need to uh, mention in your history whether it has been oral or digital one or vaginal or anal rape and the current method of contraception she's been taking, um, any missed pill or late pills or any displacement of fentanyl or intrauterine uh, property uh, devices following any trauma. So uh, these are the questions. So the first question was initial management of the patients whether she's conscious or not, and how you're going to approach that patient. The second set of questions involve uh, risk of pregnancy. And uh, the third set of questions involve sexually transmitted infection question, where you have to ask about any vaginal discharge, or if she's been taking any medicines, how many sexual partners does she have, was the sex, was the sex coer uh, coercive, or was it uh, with the consent, and how many people were involved, with the type of the sex she had and uh, what was the ethnicity of the people uh, who uh, did this kind of event with her. And uh, then uh, the other questions like medical history, uh, because asthma being epilepsy, epilepsy can affect the line of management of the patient's treatment uh, when you're prescribing or dealing with the patient coming with sexual assault. Then the surgical history is uh, uh, you need to ask about uh, because uh, this is a routine history you need to take because if she's been having any trauma and you need to mention whether she has any previous scar because you have to take it to the patient for, uh, you know, uh, major surgery. And uh, then you have to ask about allergy because if you're planning for property, then you need to mention that I need to know about allergy because if I have to give her proper uh, IUCD, uh, so as to rule out for this. Then um, the smoking or alcohol or any recreational drugs and the support at home and what does she do for a living. In case the patient is, is less than 16 years, um, then any other family member uh, who have known about the incident and uh, or any propensity of her to be around those people uh, through which she can be uh, you know, in touch or at more hazardous of having this sexual assault in incidents again in the future. So these are the things which has to be included in your history. So everything was included, but you need to mention these uh, few points which I've mentioned. The next thing is the, the next thing which I ask you regarding what is the chain of evidence? So um, the chain of evidence is, uh, um, taking an early evidence from the people. Um, so it's actually the, from the people who has been assigned this duty. And um, so this is actually the Satu response. So Satu people are actually the main, the SARC. So uh, th these are just like SARC. And these are actually involved with the, with the uh, you know, um, uh, these cases in the Ireland and the main uh, point which, they, which through which they deal with is the forensic clinical examination and care, health check and care and collection storage of forensic evidence without immediate reporting to of and Garda Sociana. So these are the police department which are actually there in Ireland dealing with all these things. So um, you have to first take a consent of the patient Um, for this, uh, explain the procedure when you're doing it. Take a consent of the patient. Consent is sought for forensic clinical examination by the SATU. So use unmarked petrol core where possible, where possible. So these police uh, or the people who has been assigned by the SATU, these are Garda, should dress in plain clothes if possible. Avoid areas where complainant may be identifiable if possible. Early use of evidence gift kit if it is indicated and change of clothing brought with the complainant to Satu, be aware and sensitive to the needs of the complainant. So these are the duties of uh, these Garda, which are assigned by the Satu for collection of the samples. And these are the six centers which are present in Ireland. If the examiner asks you, so you need to know, um, for Donegal, Dublin, or Galway, or Moringa, or Waterford, where uh, these uh, people can be given support to. 
So the important thing, uh, discuss contacting and Barda Sociana, that is the police, RCC. So these are the uh, support groups. Uh, these personals are available 24 seven to support the patient. You'll have to discuss with the patient the relevance of contacting a SATU, that why you're contacting them. And if she wants to uh, save, wants the samples to be saved and doesn't want a case to be filed this, uh, at this moment. So still these people can come and save these samples for her. And after these, these samples uh, would be, uh, you know, sent for the, you know, further, uh, further inquiry and uh, the case um, by the judiciary if she wants to take a hat this case for, otherwise it will be saved with the statute. So you have to explain this process to the patient for you know, uh, maintaining the chain of evidence and also for uh, when she doesn't want to go ahead with the case, but later on changes the mind. Depending upon the circumstances, for example, the patient has serious injury, the forensic clinical examiner can carry out forensic clinical examination at the referring hospital. If not involving a statute, examine the patient, document finding and treat accordingly. Consider emergency contraception, chlamydia prophylaxis, hepatitis B vaccine, HIV uh, prophylaxis, and uh, check uh, like child protection and safety issues if the child age, age, age is less than 16, whether home is safe, support of family or friends, and then consider Tesla referral or primary care team referral STI follow-up. Okay, so Tesla is the same one as that of the SATU. In some areas, it's called a Tesla, and the other areas, it's called a SATU. And the guard are the person who are dealing with collection of the sample, which has been assigned a duty from SATU. So, um, so the chain of the evidence, so the early evidence kit contains disposable gloves, five swabs, small universal container, large container for urine sample, sterile water, and a temper evidence bag. So um, first of all, when you're, uh, when I ask you the question, what is the chain of evidence, you need to mention about this kit. And then you need to tell the uh, examiner that uh, the collection uh, has to be taken from a victim of a crime. And the woman should be advised not to wash or wipe herself if she's consider considering a forensic medical examination. She should not eat, drink, or pass urine prior to early evidence being collected. Or in an early evidence kit, should be used to collect the evidence and this is available in the emergency department. This should be sealed card book containing a plastic pot for urine sample, a toilet paper, a mouth swab and a mouth rinse and instructions on how to use the kit. The collection of the samples can capture vital evidence and should be taken at the earliest opportunity and an early urine sample may increase the chances of detecting drugs or alcohol that may have been used to facilitate sexual assault. So chain of evidence is actually, uh, guys, is a legal concept and it is used for all the samples that may be used as evidence in a court case. So all samples taken should have an unbroken paper trail account of where and when the evidence was obtained, by whom, and any person handling the samples and the places and the condition of the storage. So this must be documented with a note of time, date, place, and signatures. So this is how the um, you know, chain of evidence is saved. So, um, so this is how this is a special uh, photograph which I've taken from the HSC guideline, and uh, you can find it in their uh, pages. And this shows that how you what is the process of using the evidence uh, early evidence kit uh, for the patient um, who has willingly given a consent for maintaining or uh, saving these samples. So you can take it from that guideline. So it, it says that the guard who is present for the collection of these samples should have no prior contact with the suspect. So Check the expiry date of the early evidence kit. Gloves must be worn. Explain the purpose of the early evidence kit. Obtain from the complainer her his written consent, which is one of the most prime important importance in case of taking uh, samples. To enable the forensic scientists to interpret any results obtained, GARDA must fill out the information. And um, the forensic clinical examination should be informed that early evidence kit was used and whether urine or oral swabs have been taken. So, um, so uh, the this the orals in case of the oral sex. So it says that the sample has to be taken within twenty four hours. Otherwise, there is no use of any, uh, you know, uh, taking samples because this is going to reduce the importance of it. So the, these are the key points uh, from where you have to take the swabs. Swab site is inside the mouth, gum, teeth, lips, inform the forensic examiner when an early evidence kit has been used. 
So um, this is the timeline uh, which they have mentioned in their guideline about the different time zones to which you have to take the sample form. Then uh, in the examination, you can say that you are going to examine the patient with the vitals and also check the patient's general physical condition, whether the patient is oriented in time and space, she's been responding to the questions you've been asking to, whether uh, she has been offered help and uh, uh, proper confidence through which she, she can produce and give information. She has been provided information uh, for the SATU and also um, whether she has been given information she wants to go ahead with uh, saving the samples to um, the chain of evidence. So following the commission of sexual crime, evidence for the presence of semen can be lost from the mouth within six hours and from the rectum, it is lost within 24 hours and from the vagina within 48 hours. So ideally, STIs such as hepatitis B and other infections, including HIV, needs to be treated within 48 hours and 72 hours respectively. So emergency contraception should be administered as soon as possible, however, can be administered up to 120 hours and alcohol and other substances begin to reduce in the body within 24 to 48 hours. The sooner a victim of sexual crime is provided with psychological support, the more beneficial it can be. So uh, this is also the transfer and storage of the kits. So the examiner might ask you this question because there was a separate question on this uh, uh, taking of the samples. Then there was a question about patient with serious injury or unconscious patient. So uh, it has to be according to the right to the life, the right to the bodily integrity, and the right to privacy, and the right to self-determination. We have to decide about whether how much patient, uh, the patient is bleeding, the patient's unconscious level, whether there is an intra-abdominal bleed or not. So after doing the initial management of the patient, I'm involving multidisciplinary team, involving the surgical team and also my consultant and uh, uh, the forensic department. So acting on these principles, so the decision to take the uh, sample has to be taken in the best interest of the patient. And all steps taken in decision made are clearly documented and has to be informed after consulting decision. So, and when the patient regains the capacity to, to understand, they are informed as soon as possible that a forensic clinical examination was performed and why. If she wants to go ahead with the, uh, you know, the proceedings in the uh, court, she can, otherwise these samples can be destroyed or saved so that she can safely take a decision later on. Um, I hope I have cleared your point, Halda. But uh, uh, don't just uh, say this the answer in a very bluntly way that, no, I'm not going to do this. So just say it in a very democratic manner. So that uh, it's actually uh, depending, the, it usually depends upon the patient's condition. If the patient is unconscious and seriously injured. So the first uh, important thing uh, would be to uh, stabilize the patient. As soon as I have informed my consultant and done the initial management, I'm going to arrange for the ultrasound scan, CT scan, CT brain, because I'm suspecting that she might be having some brain injury, might be suspecting there may be some intra-abdominal bleed for which I'm going to arrange the scan of the patient. I'm going to check her uh, um, uh, suspect to rule out for any bleeding in the because of the rupture or also because of some other major injuries involving bigger vessels in the body. And uh, after ruling out all these things, my, uh, my DD would also involve that she might be having some bleeding because of some um, uh, broad ligament hematoma uh, that might have ruptured because of some extensive sexual intercourse. So in that case, uh, after um, making sure that all these things has been ruled out, and if in case if this has been present, then my uh, next thing would be to arrange for the surgical team assistant and the plan of management accordingly. And after arranging all these things, um, um, we can discuss with the consultant regarding the safe, uh, regarding the uh, collection of these samples, which might involve SATU or the Guardia in that case, and the police. Uh, so uh, this can be discussed with the family members if these are present, and we can um, uh, we can tell the patient uh, later on uh, when the patient gains uh, capacity. So uh, so that the forensic clinical exam that the forensic clinical examination has been performed and why. Uh, so that if she wants to take a head to the proceedings to court uh, when she regains or gets better, uh, she can take uh, forward her uh, case accordingly. Okay. So the management uh, was uh, um, was perfect. 
I wanted you to um, make sure that you know all these points uh, because this is quite different from the way it has come in the MRCOG. Um, regarding the uh, regarding the assessment and treatment, so um, first you have to uh, make sure that what kind of physical injuries the patient is having, uh, which requires urgent medical attention or not. In case this involves the urgent medical attention, you need to stabilize the patient. But if in case the injuries doesn't involve any, these are the minor injuries, uh, you need to take a, a sample if she wants to give a head, uh, you know, consent to. And if she doesn't, uh, then you can just uh, uh, give a you know a major treatment for these minor injuries, and the patient uh, will need to be medically safe prior to transfer to forensic suite, where the victim is not safe for transfer. A forensic medical examiner or sexual offences examiner can attend the hospital to conduct the forensic examination. So it's very important that severe injuries, especially those associated with delayed complications, are ruled out. Examples like head injuries, area obstruction, signature strangulation, or concealed bleeding. So these are the things which actually are coming into your mind when you're uh, dealing over the, you know, DDs. And if uh, uh, the injuries are minor, you need to just uh, clean the address wound and take present samples to take So uh, the emergency contraception, you need to mention all these things. There are three types of the emergency contraception which are very available. For example, the levonorgestrel, uh, LR1, and the copper ICD. Depending upon the history of the patient, I can give her uh, levonorgestrel or LR1 or copper ICD, which has to be given within five days of sex unprotected sexual intercourse. The sexually transmitted infection has to be ruled out. If in case the patient is having high risk uh, history of having uh, sexually contracting sexually transmitted infection, then the antibiotic prophylaxis of the Noria and Chlamydia can be considered in certain circumstances. And the common regime of oral cefixine, 400 milligram and azithromycin one gram has to be given to the patient. Routine screening is to be taken out about 10 to 14 days because why this has to be done in, in this uh, uh, 14 days is that this is the window period and uh, through which if the patient has contracted from the assailant, uh, the, these infections, then these are not going to come back from the swab at the time of examination the patient was having. And uh, this has to be repeated at 10 to 14 days, and then at three months of the time at follow-up. Then um, uh, for the HIV, if the patient is having the, um, you know, um, uh, the sexual assault by the group of the people, uh, who are no, suspect to known to have HIV or suspect to be from an area of high prevalence or suspect uh, of a male known to have uh, sex with other men or a suspect known to have an IV drug user. In that case, the post-exposure prophylaxis after sexual exposure has to be started, which has to be within 72 hours and is to be continued for four weeks afterwards. And in that case, you need to repeat the HIV testing at four months of the follow-up, okay? So this is the uh, uh, 72 hours of exposure. You continue for 28 days. And then hepatitis B vaccination uh, has to be recommended for sexual assault victims. And this has to be given within six weeks of the assault, not later than that. And the dose regime is at exposure, one week post exposure, and three weeks post exposure. So this was regarding hepatitis B, HIV, sexually transmitted infections, and the pregnancy uh, you've dealt with by giving the uh, emergency contraception and then dealing with the mental health of the patient. So the mental health of the patient might have short-term psychological response, intrusive memories, flashbacks, and anxiety, fear, anger, irritability, sleep difficulties, nightmares, avoidance and withdrawal, low mood and depression, dissociation, and sexual and relationship difficulties. So uh, patient might go into the post-traumatic stress disorder. So I need to uh, evaluate the patient at the duration of about one month to rule out that the patient is not having any post-traumatic stress disorder. In that case, if the patient is prone to have this effect, then we need to discuss with the patient special um, support groups, which in Irish are RCC. So these RCC are the special uh, you know, support groups which deal with the uh, patient, patient's mental health. So once they have been uh, having this issue, 
you need to refer the patient uh, to such uh, people. So this is the uh, main uh, you know, uh, thing through which uh, your management has to be moved on while talking to the examiner, the GP or emergency department response. So RCP personnel, so these are the support group people who are actually available 24 seven to evaluate these patients that, that how mentally they have been you know, disturbed. And uh, the Garda, uh, so Shana, the police department discuss with the patient the relevance of SATU and uh, forensic clinical examiner uh, has to be informed according to the patient uh, injuries and also the circumstances. If not involving SOT tool, then examine the patient, document findings, and treat accordingly. So now, how are you going to document the patient findings? So while telling this point to the examiner, just tell the examiner that uh, examination has to be uh, by special people who are uh, specialists in doing all these things. If the patient has refused, for uh, not documenting all these, uh, you know, uh, event to the uh, uh, expert people, then in that case, uh, those persons who are present in the emergency um, in the gynae department who know that how to do the examination of such a patient needs to be present there. Nobody can, uh, anybody cannot do this examination. So, first of all, you need to see uh, whether uh, this patient's injury is bleeding or not. In case the patient's injuries is not bleeding, just, you know, wipe off. Um, and if she wants to go ahead with the sample save, go with the sample save. Otherwise, you can just, you know, uh, wipe off the samples, uh, or wipe off that minor injury point, and then injuries are identified and it should be recorded accurately. So each injury uh, would be uh, written in the clinical notes, including the shape, depth, color, and the tenderness. And the type of the injury uh, should be noted in the clinical notes in terms of bruises. So what kind of abrasion was it? Was it a laceration? And if you're unsure of the type of the trauma, then in that case, it is better to make a careful and concise description. And if possible, um, we may use a 4D diagram and a tape measure, which can measure the size of the injury and its distance from the fixed anatomical landmark. For example, one into three centimeter it is. Um, so you can say that it is one into three centimeter uh, bluish purplish uh, type of the bruise, which is of about five centimeter and it is above the left knee joint. So this type of description has to be given. So why I'm explaining you this, that in, quest uh, in question, they can show you the photo where you have to, uh, you know, describe all this image and uh, tell the examiner that this is about three to four centimeter bruise and it is about uh, above five centimeter above the left knee, and then uh, it's a purple in color. So uh, it has to be uh, shown in actually in a diagram manner. And if it is possible, you can take a photograph of that injury, but the written consent will be necessary for this. And if a police is involved, then they can arrange a trained specialist photographer who can take non-intimate images, okay? So this was uh, sometimes, uh, uh, when uh, you're recording these genital injuries, so these can be uh, photo documented by using even a corpus score. Okay, so this was all regarding the sexual assault. Uh, hope I've uh, cleared every point. So uh, thank you, yeah. thank you very okay. much. So is there any other question you'd like to ask, or anybody who wants to ask? I'm here to clear about all the points. Anyone who has question regarding the, so uh, there was one more question. So, so the timing of the samples. So you said about uh, Halda uh, regarding the vaginal swab and also um, the anal and swab. And yeah. Swabs. So what, what was the timing you mentioned? I think what I remembered from the talk article, it was seven days for vaginal. It was uh, two days from oral and three days from uh, uh, anal intercourse yeah so you need to yeah you're you're right so you need to mention uh you can remember it with the formula of 732 so i always made a formula of 732 so seven days for for the vaginal penetration you can take a swab within seven days of the assailant has been uh, sexual assault has been coming uh, to you and two days yeah. after oral penetration and uh, three days after the anal penetration and what about the toxicology screen so toxicology screen will be sent from the blood within three days of the assault 
and uh, till 14 days i think till 14 and from days the urine. yeah so it's uh, from the urine uh, from about within 14 days of birth so uh, so these are the different uh, samples with uh, when the patient comes uh, this has to be done by the specialist uh, group of people if not then we can do it um, after involving our consultant the toxicology screen the samples and then the follow up which for the hepatitis c for the sexually transmitted infection for the hiv and for the uh, like the contraception you have given okay uh, so this was all from me thank you so much guys for participation especially khalda and i am very confident that you're going to do it very well but at few points which i have pointed out regarding satu and uh, this uh, you know gardia and uh, also uh, tesla and the rcc or curry okay so follow up has to be with the rcc the point number 9 appropriate follow up including um rcc curry is organized so somebody has raised a hand uh, can i see who is the one who wants to ask question yeah Pasiha? is that you hello yeah can you hear me yeah i can hear you yeah, I want to ask uh, the documentation will be in the lay language or in the medical language? Yeah, the documentation has to be in the medical language because you're saving it for the record uh, for the court. So it has to be with the special landmarks. For example, the way I've given you the examples like a uh, knee joint about five into six centimeter, is it a bruise or a laceration? Or how many centimeter? Is it bleeding? Is it fresh? No. Okay. But this has to be by the special people, okay? Not, uh, not the one you're going to do it. Uh, so if the examiner asks you that, are you the one who's going to do the examination? So it's, the questions should be answered like, it's actually the special uh, guard who has been assigned this form of examination. It has been the special oh, people who done from the yeah, too. Um, so we need to inform them. But if in case the patient doesn't want system. to go ahead uh, with, the, with these kind of examinations, in that case, the person who has a special uh, who has a special uh, interest and especially has uh, expertise of doing this examination needs to do this and this has to be after performing the you know uh, consultant yes dr samasvar um, can you tell me what's your question no question just, just i want to tell you that i miss your voice and oh, i'm very happy to join this uh, free session and I'm okay. thankful for you and thankful for Dr. Ausma for the great course you give to me. And just uh, it's very helpful to got this MRSI exam. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Samaya. Thank you so much. And once again, congratulations for you on passing this OSCE. So Samaya has been our thank student you. and yeah, she was a wonderful student I had and she had passed her OSCE exam. Thank you, Dr. Ausma for all your help. Thank you. Okay, so is there anybody else who wants to ask this question regarding sexual assault or we need to give a, you know, second question a go? Anybody else would like to ask questions regarding sexual assaults? Okay, so Adam, uh, I think I've done with the station. So you can ask Dr. Uzma Aleem to take over. Uh, yes, Dr. Usma, she's available here and she will be joining. She's right here with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Dear participants, don't go away anywhere. Dr. Usma is joining us. Thank you so much for being here. Hello everyone, can you hear me everyone? I cannot hear anyone. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's great. Hello, I'm Dr. Usma and uh, thanks 
everyone for joining in. And uh, I would like to start with Dr. Sama because uh, really she was our brilliant student and Alhamdulillah, she passed in her first go. Dr. Sama, are you still there? Yes, I'm still there. How are you, Dr. Sama? Feeling very, very happy and, uh, you know, relieved, right? Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Thank you very much, Dr. Azma. And, uh, you know, uh, really, uh, whatever you give me, all of you, I find in the exam, like obstetrical stasis, like sexual assault, um, um, everything I, I found in the exam. And thank you very much. No, you are more than welcome, doctor. It is all your hard work. And um, really, we just polished it, nothing else. You were already, you know, your knowledge was very good. So Alhamdulillah, I'm very happy that uh, all of our students, they passed and uh, I expected them all to pass, actually. Thank you very much. So again. can you tell uh, our uh, participants, Dr. Sama, what you, what you liked in the course? <clears throat> yeah, actually the course was full of knowledge. Like all the material was there, more than, more than I need. Uh, uh, like I told, um, 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 and I'm to put uh, everything for me. She put all things that I'm, uh, I have reference to study. Um, and um, uh, um, it was like concentrated. I, I, um, I, I, I study with you like only uh, two, three weeks maximum. Then Alhamdulillah, I was Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Actually, what we try to do in the course is not only to perform the station, but also to update your knowledge about the related topic. Because uh, once you finish your written part, things, you know, they just go a little back in your mind. So just to make them come again back to your memory and remember them in exam, that is why I created all those materials so that uh, our knowledge is refreshed. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Sama, for joining. Also, Dr. Osma, thank you for the long case because the long case, I was not that much uh, know about what I will do, what I will tell. Uh, so um, uh, both of you, you and Dr. As Asma, teach me how to manage this uh, long case. It was very strange for me. Thank you very much again. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Sama. And we really appreciate your appreciation for us. And uh, actually, you were also very so much hardworking. And you, uh, whatever we uh, took out mistakes from you, we you urgent immediately, you know, uh, made it correct. So that is how you made made it go through this long case very easily. Thank you so much again. Thank you. And Dr. Asma, it was a great presentation. Very well done. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Asma. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have how many people over here and nobody want to take the station? Uh, it is not going to be tough, my dear. You, anybody can, you know, among you can just come forward and take the station. Dr. Kritika, Dr. Misba, Fatima, Ibrahim, who is Innocent's iPad, iPhone 3, Khalida, Dr. Manikam. Yeah, I think anybody can try because it's very, uh, you know, it's a free webinar and you're getting the platform where you've been assessed by two mentors at this moment. And this is a, a very good thing that you need to come up at this stage so that we can take out all the mistakes and you'll come to know that how is actually this exam done. Mm -hmm. The presentation, presentation to a mentor is actually an exercise to which you can, you know, make a good change in yourself. So I would really recommend uh, to have a go for the free uh, webinar uh, in this exercise with us. Um, though it seems like it's, you know, you don't know anything, but uh, sometimes uh, doing a practice of the unseen topics with a mentor is a great exercise. It's okay, Dr. Fatma, even FCPS, it will help you, don't worry. Uh, it's that, that is what we told that this uh, uh, webinar is uh, helpful for all boards, be it uh, FCPS, MRCOG, MRCPI or EPCOG, because the basic knowledge is the same. So you yeah, just- Yeah, Dr. Uzma, you know, this FCPS exam has recently been changed and it's more like have become of uh, more like, you know, RCPI and RCOG now. So if she, want, she wants, is preparing for FCPS and she wants to take a go, then I would really encourage her to have a go. Yes, Fatma, you can take the station. 
Are you there with yes, us? Yes, oh, ma'am. Great. Okay, so uh, just I want to brief you uh, based because as this is for MRCPI OSCE, what happens in MRCPI OSCE, you have one long case and you have seven uh, OSCE stations. In the long case, you have patient interaction. Since it was COVID era, so we did uh, patient interaction in a simulated patient. It was not a real patient and it was not hospital setting exam. Uh, it was uh, just uh, a role player with the history. You will finish your history with the role player. There is a mannequin where you will perform the examination. And two examiners will be there who will be observing you for your history taking your examination, and then the discussion part will come. So it's a total uh, 25 minutes station where you have to complete history, examination, and discussion, everything. So this is about the long case. And the OSCE stations, they are for 10 minutes each. And uh, you and the examiner are sitting only. The station is written uh, on a piece of paper. And then the discussion starts from there. So for MRCPI, you have to have real knowledge your background knowledge should be very strong because there is no role player like MRCOG where you can get marks here and there with the communication and your manners and this and that. Here, your, your marks will be in your knowledge only. So just make your knowledge up to date and then you are you know easy to pass the exam, no problem. So for this uh, previous exam, this station came in last March exam and this is your topic, Dr. Fatma, uh, because in MRCPI, only few lines are written uh, in the station. You have to start yourself, okay? I will just show you uh, your station one minute. Okay, this is your station, and uh, you will have 10 minutes and to finish your task, okay? Okay, ma'am. All right, let me put the timer for you. <clears throat> All right, can you start, doctor? Okay. Hello, my name is Dr. Fatima. I'm one of the doctors in the gynec clinic today. May I confirm your name and age, please? Uh, hello, I'm Jonalyn, and I'm 35 years old. Uh, okay, Janalyn, uh, I have read from your notes um, uh, about your problem, and um, I am here to address all your concerns. And before that, I have to ask you uh, the history questions so that I can um, I can uh, um, discuss the further management with you, and then we can uh, uh, end up with to a management plan to a safe management plan. That is that okay with you? Yes, doctor. Sure. Uh, so, Janalyn, um, I wanted to ask, uh, can you tell me more about your condition, please? Yes, doctor. See, um, I'm having this weird abdominal pain um, in my lower tummy, and it increases with my periods, and um, it's really bothering me. I checked with the GP. He did some test, uh, which he said, uh, I will see the results with you here today. And um, this is really affecting my work and my life. So I want to know why I'm having this pain. So adrenaline, what kind of, can you please rate the pain from zero to 10? Uh, how much the where the pain is? See doctor, the pain is not uh, all the time. It is just increased uh, during my periods, just before my periods. And it becomes little less uh, once the period finishes. And um, uh, on a scale, I would say that once I'm about to have my period, the scale is like eight to 10, it's severe. I cannot do anything. I cannot move from the bed and I miss my work as well. So it's I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, so it means that you must be using some injectables during your period. Sometimes some I go to take injectables. Sometimes I take some analgesia, otherwise some tablets, you know, Okay, so is it associated with fever or um, vomiting, nausea? I feel nauseous, but no fever. Okay, and does it go to, to your back or to your thighs, any other part of the body it goes to? Yes, doctor, it goes to my back passage, it goes to my lower back, it radiates to my legs, it's too much. 
Okay. So um, you told me that it starts during the period. So it in increases as the days of the periods and the bleeding increases. It remains the same, but it is more bef just before the period. And once the period starts, it is like day one, day two, it's very severe. Then it's slowly it just starts going down. Okay. <clears throat> so is it associated with any vaginal discharge? No, nothing. Okay. Okay, so what about your um bowel symptoms? Um, bowel symptoms. Are are your bowels okay? What about your water works? Yes, doctor, everything is fine, but okay. I feel that uh, for my bowel, you know, uh, once I'm having periods, sometimes I feel there's some blood coming in my stool. So I don't know why it's coming during the period specifically. Okay, and since how long uh, you are having this pain, uh, Jonalyn? Maybe three years now, doctor. Okay, and along with that, uh, bleeding in the uh, bleeding in the stool too. Uh, so, uh, Jonalyn, would you um, also tell me that uh, um, what about the pain during the? Uh, I would like to ask you some personal questions. What about the pain during um, during intercourse? Uh, do you feel any pain or bleeding? during intercourse? Uh, yes, doctor, I feel a lot of pain during intercourse, uh, no bleeding, but there's a lot of pain, which is affecting my sexual life as well. Okay, okay. So, uh, Jonalyn, have you uh, had any uh, blood tests or um, any ultrasound run for this um, uh, for this problem? Or do you have you gone to the GP, given some medicines, any medicines you have uh, used before for this problem? Yes, doctors, once the pain started, initially I used to take over-the-counter painkillers and uh, mm -hmm. I will take a lot of them to, you know, continue to work. Uh, but mm -hmm. slowly and gradually the pain increased. Then I went to the GP. He also gave me his only painkillers. And then mm -hmm. he did some investigation recently uh, mm -hmm. because I was busy at work. So, you know, I didn't get the time to go and see the doctor. Anyways, he did some investigation and he said, today you will see the results. Uh, so the results are here, I think. And uh, I will show you the results. Okay, doctor. Okay, okay. So uh, you only took painkillers. No hormonal drugs were given to you before that? No, not yet. He said, uh, you will design some plan for me. Uh, okay. So, Jonalyn, what about uh, your fertility um, uh, wishes? Um, do you want a child? I mean, do you have a child before? Um, no, doctor, I don't have a child, but I really want to have a child now. That's why I, you know, I am in a stable relationship for past one year and I'm not using any contraception. So I want to have a child right now. Okay. Do you mind me asking, do you have any other sexually or shared infections? Mm, no. Okay. Uh, do you go uh, for any medical illnesses to your GP? like diabetes, hypertension, any other illnesses like that? No. Okay, any surgery from your tummy or down below? No, doctor. Okay, uh, are you allergic to any drug? No. Okay, and uh, family history of any concern, please? Mm, no, not really. Okay, so um, how, uh, what do you do for living, Jonalyn? I'm a librarian doctor. Okay, and how's the support at home? It's great. My partner is very supportive. Okay, would you mind asking me about your weight to height ratio? Yeah, it's 28, Dr. BMI. Okay, uh, it's a bit raised. Um, so uh, have you been trying some exercises? Yes, my GP told me to, you know, do some uh, healthy diet stuff and some exercise. So I'm working on that. Okay, so I'm sorry to ask you some personal questions. Do you smoke? No. Use alcohol? Occasionally. Okay, any recreational drug, please? Never. Okay, thank you for um, the information, Jonalyn. Um, I'm here to address your concerns. And before uh, we discuss, start discussing, do you, uh, do you want to tell me that you have any concerns regarding your condition? No, doctor, I'm just worried that why this pain is coming and will this affect my fertility because I want to plan a baby in future. Okay, okay. Uh, 
BMI twenty seven. Ma'am, now should I start uh, uh, telling about the investigations that I want more more of the investigations? Yeah, and if you want any imaging, I will show you one image. Which uh, is done yes, uh, I want a transvaginal scan, please, um, if available. Just just present on the call. So See, um, I gave you the, this one diagnosis. Okay. Yes. Um, what do you think, doctor? I have. Um. Actually, uh, from the reports that you've shown me, Jonalyn, today, um, do you have any uh, any one accompanying you, or are you alone today in the clinic? I'm alone today, doctor. Any problem? Anything? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, yes, uh, Jonalyn, I have some difficult uh, uh, news for you. So, if you want, I can call the nurse to accompany you, or um, if you want, you can ask anyone to accompany you. It's fine, doctor. Your nurse can accompany me. Okay. So, Jonalyn, uh, from the blood reports that um, uh, you have shown me, there is um, uh, there is a protein uh, which is known as CA125, uh, which is uh, raised um, in your case. And uh, usually, we uh, from your history that you told me that uh, you're having pain during the periods and severe pain during the intercourse. So, it seems that... Um, uh, and uh, along with that, you're also having uh, uh, infertility. So uh, you want fertility. So it seems that you are having a condition uh, in, which the, uh, in which the lining of the womb uh, is being uh, 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 displaced outside the, uh, outside the womb. Uh, and um, this is uh, by different mechanisms that are uh, ongoing in the body. And uh, this leads to uh, the lining of the womb is getting deposited uh, outside your womb. I mean, in the, it can be in your ovaries, it can be in your tubes, it can be uh, in your abdomen. So that is uh, uh, making uh, uh, your condition worse. And that for, for this reason, you are having this uh, pain during the menstruation and pain during the sexual intercourse. Uh, am I, uh, are you with me, Jonalyn? Yes, doctor, I'm with you. Uh, your time finished, but anyways, you continue. Okay, yeah. Yes, doctor, I'm with you. So is it serious, something very serious, doctor? Uh, well, uh, uh, it is, uh, Jonalyn, I would like to clear to you that it is a benign condition. Benign condition means it's, um, uh, uh, it is, it's not a cancerous condition. I would like to show you on that. But uh, for the, your better management and for your uh, uh, treatment, we need to, what we need to do is that as we have confirmed this from the transvaginal scan. So now we need to do is the, uh, we have, we need to do is a keyhole surgery. And then in the keyhole surgery, we need to look uh, inside uh, your abdomen and in your pelvis and uh, to see where these uh, deposits of the womb are present. And we need to uh, take out the deposits, burn them or need to just take out the deposits so that um, uh, you, your pain is relieved and um, as you also want uh, to get pregnant so that would be the best option for you so what we will do is during the keyhole surgery we will inspect all uh, we'll inspect all your uh, abdomen and we'll inspect your pelvis and then we will remove uh, we will like to remove the deposits uh, so uh, so uh, we'll later send uh, the deposits to the lab to confirm our diagnosis and um, um, most hopefully uh, after that you will be able to uh, you will be able to conceive as we are going to going to put you on some uh, medications uh, in which uh, your ovaries uh, will be making um, uh, we will stimulate your ovaries to make uh, more eggs and uh, we'll uh, we'll ask you to uh, take those medicines during the periods and we will uh, stimulate your ovaries and we will um, we will be 
expecting that you you get pregnant after uh, after the after the surgery is being done uh, but before that i need to also tell you that there are uh, some pros and cons uh, and some complications of the surgery which we will we'll, uh, give you in the form of patient information leaflet you can go through that and then you can uh, decide with your partner too uh, that uh, uh, further uh, what uh, management you need but in your case as you want uh, your fertility so the best option for you here is the surgery and also we are going to test your tubes uh, uh, during the surgery to see if, the, if there are any deposits in the tubes that are blocking your tubes and uh, wh wherever the deposits are we are need to going to remove that and um, uh, then we are going to see what we can do for the uh, what we can do for you but uh, i will also like to tell you that this condition has uh, different stages of course the stage 1 is the least uh, of the uh, it's minimal and uh, the stage 4 is the uh, is the maximum uh, of the stage in which there is a lot of um, in the stage 4 there's a lot of adhesions and the um, stage three and four there's a lot of adhesions and a lot of deposits of the womb and uh, in that case um, i'm afraid that uh, we uh, offer the patient the uh, assisted reproductive techniques uh, in the form of in vitro fertilization are you with me jonalyn yes doctor you have loaded me with a lot of information uh, yeah um, i know I know it's a lot of information for you, so I'm going to give you patient information leaflets. And uh, in the, that uh, patient information and leaflet, we are also, uh, it would, the description of in vitro fertilization would be given to. Do you know about in vitro fertilization? Yes, doctor, I've heard about it. But right now, I'm really concerned about what you told me, the surgery. So I need to discuss this with my partner, and I'll get back to you, doctor. Okay, sure. Uh, of John and then. Thank you for your time. Thank you, doctor. Okay, very well done, Dr. Fatma. Uh, one more thing, if uh, this patient, you need to examine what you are looking for in this patient for this particular case. What is your diagnosis right now? Ma'am, uh, on history and ex uh, on history only, uh, the diagnosis was endometriosis. Examination, of course, I would like to do her uh, abdominal examination. Of course, for before that, the vitals need to be checked. The abdominal examination uh, for any abdominal mass, and then for the local examination needs to be done to see if any endometrial deposits are present in the vagina in the form of speculum examination and the biomanual examination in which there would be biomanual um, uh, tenderness um, would be present on the pelvic examination. Okay, anything else you want to see in the abdominal examination and then on vaginal examination? Um, Ma'am... Uh... Uh, along with that, the tenderness, I would like to see a, a lower abdominal tenderness. She is having um, any abdominal mass she is having and uh, uh, any previous scars, anything like that. I would like to uh, inspect the abdomen for that. And, uh, for, and for vaginal examination, of course, um, uh, I would also like to assess the uterine size uh, and... Uh, uh, if it's freely mobile or not, and any uh, which are any deposits of the uh, endometriosis in the vagina. Uh, maybe I see them, maybe I don't. But uh, uh, and also uh, I will also elicit the tenderness um, because I'm I'm uh, uh, expecting here that the bimanual on bimanual examination tenderness would be present. And uh, and in the fornices, um, uh, maybe I I feel the uh, I feel uh, any cyst. In, uh, in the bilateral fornices. Yeah, this is what I want to know from you. Uh, you came to it, but uh, you took a little time. Anyways, uh, you know the topic. This is very good. So how you feel about your performance, Fatma? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it was, uh, I mean, it was just a surprise for me that, I mean, I had to present. So I don't know. No, no. I mean, you, I you think I... Ma'am, I um the main problem that I'm having is that I cannot manage the time. So that is the main problem that uh, I'm having. You see, time management comes with practice. The more you practice, the more you speak in front of someone, you become perfect in a few days' time. It's not a big deal. And I think you performed very well. Uh, just you need to organize your history. 
and there were a few things which you missed in the history. Uh, so I will just tell you, you started with the presenting complaint, that's very good, and history of presenting complaint. It was little haphazard, your history of presenting complaint. And why you want, uh, you took this breaking bad news uh, steps? It is just endometriosis. Just because CA125F70 doesn't mean that I'm suffering from cancer. Yes, ma'am. Right, so no need to follow this BBN. Uh, other than that, you didn't ask anything about my menstrual history, dear. Yeah, ma'am, I that I forgot. So this was the LMP very... and the contraception. Yes. Yeah. So you, this is very important. Pap smear, contraception, last period. How many days I bleed? How much is this menorrhea? Intermenstrual bleeding, postcoital bleeding. So no, uh, just make a format of your history. Uh, with the history, history presenting complaint, if a gynae patient, menstrual history, then obstetric history, past medical, past surgical, any medicines she's taking, any allergies, social, you covered most of the things, but you just missed this very important menstrual history. So once you, you know, forget something in a webinar, you will remember it forever in your life. So now I'm sure you will not forget. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh, this uh, station came in the exam this time. It was a long case. Uh, and uh, even uh, my students, they told me that uh, once he was examining the mannequin, uh, the role player was making uh, noises from there while sitting on the chair. So once he touched the lower abdomen, she said, oh, I have pain. Once he was doing examination, he said, oh, I have too much pain. So, you know, this type of drama was going on in the exam. Anyways, uh, what I mean to say that you, once you are doing examinations, like now it, the exam will be on the real patients. So, of course, real pe people talk, Pennykin doesn't talk. So, everything you have to, you know, uh, say verbally and uh, with the consent of the patient, you have to perform these tasks. On the mannequin, everything was verbal only. So you need to remember by heart everything what you need to say from general physical examination to abdominal examination, then vaginal examination. You need to perform a speculum examination. There's a pap smear lying there. You have to perform the pap smear. Everything you have to do on that mannequin. And then the discussion starts. So as this case, uh, uh, it was endometriosis and they ask what is your diagnosis and how you will manage. So very good, Dr. Fatma, you gave me the option of a direct uh, laparoscopy uh, surgery because I need, I want to get pregnant in future. So this is uh, best treatment for people who are planning for pregnancy. But in general, if the patient is not planning for a pregnancy, uh, in, if it is just a OSCE station, so they want you to go step-by-step -step management, not directly uh, your surgical management, okay? So here it is, endometriosis. Uh, we, we know that this is a, and you have to explain in layman language. First, you use the word benign, then you realize that this is medical jargon, so you changed it. Uh, so say that uh, this is a lining of a womb, which uh, apart from grow inside the womb, it grows outside the womb, which causes adhesions. And whenever you have periods, that part also bleeds, and that leads to uh, uh, adhesions which causes pain okay <clears throat> so you know this endometriosis is the endometrial like tissue outside the uterus which induces a chronic inflammatory reaction uh, the prevalence is at 10 to 20 percent uh, in women of reproductive age and the gold standard diagnosis is via laparoscopy laparoscopy can be diagnostic and uh, curative as well you can perform the adhesiolysis or if there's endometrioma you can remove that also so this patient dr fatma as you see this was a chocolate cyst which was there so which you need to remove so they will ask you what is this and how you will remove, uh, what is the better option? You will just aspirate the cyst or you will do a cystectomy. And what is the uh, uh, side effect of cyst cystectomy? What can happen? So you have to cover these things in your answer. Okay, so patient presents with dysmenorrhea or a chronic pelvic pain, dyspareunia, infertility, mid-cycle pain, rectal pain, bowel or bladder symptoms, chronic fatigue and malaise. 
and the combination and severity of the symptoms it, 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 uh, correlates with the degree of the disease. Okay, and the findings which I want you to say is this fixed retroverted uterus you will find, tender nodular uterosacral ligaments will be there. Uh, there can be visible nodules on the cervix and vagina. Uh, rectal examination you have to perform in such cases. Uh, so have, there can be rectal nodules and enlarged and tender ovaries like this patient. So for nurses, you can, you can feel the cyst there. So as we already said, that the gold standard for the diagnosis of endometriosis is laparoscopy and histology of the visible lesions. So you covered that part well, doctor. And uh, if you go one by one, then you have to perform a transvaginal ultrasound. And after the ultrasound, you can go for a laparoscopy. So this is what it looks on a transvaginal ultrasound. <clears throat> and if things are not very clear or you're suspecting uh, extensive endometriosis, then you can go for an MRI as well. Then this is what I expected that <clears throat> you should go one by one, uh, not to jump directly to the uh, surgical option. So the possible options of treatment are, you start with the analgesia, patient was already taking them and uh, it was not helping her. Then you go for the combined oral contraceptive pills. You can use denosol, Gestrinone, progestogens, gonadotropins, and <clears throat> leave an just to enter your uterine system. That is Marina. And then there are other options like uh, non <clears throat> formulary med things patients can do, or trans electrical nerve stimulation they can opt for if they don't want to go through this pharmacological management. And each uh, option, you should know the side effects. So remember the side effects of each medicine, especially denosol and GnRH, okay? Once you are giving GnRH, you should uh, always remember to put the patient on uh, hormone replacement therapy. Then surgery, surgery will be cystectomy and how you will perform the cystectomy. Then as per the wishes of fertility, you will... Uh, give her the option, whatever option you want to give her, or deep, superficial, everything. Any questions so far? Ma'am, uh, do I have to, um, I mean, uh, do I have to just name the medical treatment and then go uh, for the surgery? I have to say that this is, we also have options for the medical treatment uh, in the form of pills and in the form of injectables and um, intrauterine devices but uh, uh, this uh, is not suitable uh, for you right now should I say that or what should I say yeah this is uh, see uh, in FCPS how much time you have to perform the station oh uh, yeah ma'am the same the 10 minutes 10 minutes because uh, I finished long time ago so I don't know what is the recent thing uh, 10 minutes so is it uh, this one consultant based discussion or it is role player station ma'am actually they have changed the pattern so it's the first time that we are going to appear in the, in such kind of pattern so we don't have so much idea about it so did they give you outline that this will be role player will be there or it will be just a case based discussion ma'am they just said that uh, it would be role player and the simulated patients they just um, uh, print they just printed it up and uh, they put it on the net just not more than that we don't know anything more than that yeah okay. actually dr Rizma, i have taken information regarding this fcps examination any father mm -hmm. you're interested we have course for fcps uh, exam oski preparation so it's actually uh, they've been trying to inter uh, take it as a mrcog exam but uh, the long case won't be finished and long case would be might be split in three stations so in one station you'll be talking to the examiner regarding as a, as if it's a scenario has been given uh, in the first station you've been talking to the patient the way we have done in role player station in the next station there will be a station of examination and uh, and in the same station examiner might ask you questions the way we have done in mrcog structural discussion in the third station uh, they may be, uh, you know, uh, they may be a part of the first station, link station, or it may be a counseling station. So that may that will be in Urdu. So there will be different skill station also. The way you used to have in your IMM examination, 
and similarly um, uh, the you know other stations like you know resuscitation stations or breach or things like that so they've just just they just modified it because long case now they've been splitting this up the way we used to have in mrc okay that's great um, anyways as i remember when he once i did the exam there was a real patient and uh, there was history taking first and we were performing the examination on the real patient and then the discussion starts once you finish your history and examination. So it is pretty much similar to what uh, we are doing in MRCPI. MRCOG, you don't perform the examination there. But uh, yeah, rest of the things you do, the discussion part and all. So Fatma, once you are, if it is a role player station, then and if the patient, you will just like, suppose this same station comes for you. So you will just start with the patient like that since this is first you will give her the diagnosis that this is your uh, diagnosis endometriosis and you have a cyst in your ovary which is uh, called an endometrioma or a chocolate cyst we need to remove this but, but since you want to get pregnant that is why we will uh, i will tell you the option more suitable for you although uh, if a patient does not desire fertility there are a variety of options available which i can tell you if you want so if uh, you can, you know, in this way, the examiner will know that you know the other options, but since this patient needs fertility, so you are going for the surgical option first. So you have to speak like that. Okay, Fatma? Okay, ma'am. All right. So this is <clears throat> our endometriosis algorithm. It is from the NICE guideline. It covers everything. Even if you know this chart, these two charts, uh, the uh, next one to follow, uh, everything will be, you know, uh, clear to you. So when, when you suspect endometriosis in a young woman who is more than 17 years, uh, either she's having chronic pelvic pain or it's a period related pain, which is affecting her daily activities. There is deep pain during or after sexual intercourse. A uh, pain is radiating, it is cyclical, or there are GIT symptoms associated with it, or some bowel or bladder problems, urinary symptoms are there, and there is infertility also there. Then you, how you assess the patient, uh, you take the history, complete history, you perform the examination, you check for her fertility wishes uh, and how it is affecting her daily activity and what background is she from and, and is she affecting her mental health also emotional health is very very important especially in the western part of the world but i think for the exam purpose in pakistan also you have to talk about mental health and emotional health okay so you have to discuss uh, um, how she's uh, if if she's keeping a pain and symptom diary you offer her examination and identify any abnormal masses and pelvic signs and you consider the ultrasound okay uh, so <clears throat> Uh, we should know that this endometriosis is a long-term condition and it can have a significant physical, sexual, and psychological impact on a woman's life. Uh, it has uh, pay, All women, they have complex needs and they may require long-term support. So initial uh, management will be a short trial of uh, three months with the non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or a, a combined hormone pills. And you can... Uh, you can go to the this next one for uh, if the patient doesn't want the hormones, then patient can go to the neuromodulators for neuropathic pain relief. And if fertility is priority, the management of endometriosis is related to fertility should be multidisciplinary team approach uh, with input from the fertility specialist. And this should include recommended diagnostic fertility test or fertility treatments such as assisted reproduction. Uh, so this will be covered in the next slide. Uh, very good, Dr. Fatma. You told about that we will check your tubes during the laparoscopy to see if they are patent or no. Um, then you consider referral to the gynecology or pediatric or adult. As per the patient's age, uh, you will give her a trial of the analgesia and you will start the initial hormonal treatment. And based on the response of the treatment, you go to the next level of treatment. So 
do not use uh, MRI or CO125 to diagnose endometriosis. And they might ask you that what other conditions CO125 is increased. So you should know the you know, differential diagnosis and uh, based on dysmenorrhea, what is your differential diagnosis and what uh, other conditions CO125 is raised in. So you just have to answer these questions. Okay. Any questions so far? Ma'am, I was uh, um, uh, going to ask that uh, what uh, I have to uh, explain the stages uh, to the patient that they, these diseases have four stages and the were, uh, it can worsen with each uh, passing stage and the treatment will change. No, no, no. No need to talk about stages to the patient. Patient will not understand any of the stage, okay? And you have just 10 minutes. You cannot cover stages and this and that, everything. You have to stick because your marks are in the history taking, in the examination, your differential diagnosis, and your main uh, treat management. You don't have to go into the stages, okay? You might say that if it is very advanced stage, that I will refer you to the specialist unit. Okay, Fatma. Okay, ma'am. All right. Any more questions from anyone? You can open your mic and ask questions here if anyone has any question. So this slide, it is just uh, for you people to uh, revise uh, what all can cause tubal damage. It's a very good slide. I found it in Strat OG. So tubal damage can be <clears throat> due to chronic disease like severe endometriosis. It can be iatrogenic uterine instrumentation, termination of pregnancy, intrauterine contraceptive devices. It can lead to salpingitis and that leads to tubal damage and then infertility. There can be uh, sexually transmitted infections like nizaria and gonorrhea, chlamydia. Uh, major abdominal pelvic surgeries like proctocolectomies, severe infiltrating endometriosis, uh, chronic pelvic inflammatory diseases, ectopic pregnancy, so, and this all will lead to infertility. It can be transabdominal abscess, congenital abnormalities, and PIDs. So, this is our last slide, I think. Yeah. So, anybody has any questions? Please raise your hand or open your mic if you want to ask anything. Yeah, I think uh, uh, your presentation, Dr. Uzma, was very well done. Uh, it was a very good presentation. Uh, but please, Dr. Uzma, tell them that uh, this question can also come as a structural discussion where uh, the, the examiner questions would be regarding not uh, more oriented towards this question, but also might involve the patients involving having surgeries. And if the patient doesn't want to have uh, you know, fertility options open, and what other options uh, she can have. And what is the level of CA125, which might be increased in other cases uh, if we're suspecting some other cases like uh, CA125 importance, why is it raised? And uh, uh, what are the difficult, different indications? And uh, why does it doesn't make any importance when we're talking about endometriosis especially? Yeah, uh, as I told that endometriosis is not significant for uh, in one of my slides also it was there that it is not significant for uh, uh, endometriosis. Anything that causes peritoneal irritation, it will result in uh, increase in uh, CA125. So that is not uh, something, uh, you know, it will raise your concern that patient is having cancer or something. So it is just one of the markers and you should know what other conditions it is raised in. So it can be a malignancy, it can be any peritoneal irritation, it can be endometriosis. So you should know the differential diagnosis. And if it is a, uh, just a, no patient is there, so the history part, they will still ask you, what would you like to know in the history? So you should still know what you're looking for in the history. And uh, then uh, if it is just case-based discussion, then you need to go one by one with all the options. 
uh, as I just showed you this slide, uh, where it went, this one. Yeah, Fatima, you're right about the DDs. Uh, yeah, but this is only a very limited one. And there's a very beautiful talk article about CA125 level. It's been, I think, in 2020, 2021. And it's a very wonderful and beautiful talk. I think you should all go through this because this might be one of the questions CA125, the examiner can put forth you to. And uh, you need to uh, tell not specifically the benign causes of raising the CA125 levels, but also the malignant one. And there are some other mixed causes also, and there's a very beautiful table. You need to, people all go through the CA125 levels because this could be a very hard discussion when the endometriosis topic is there. And especially when the examiners are asking in long case, they can uh, take you on with this single question even for a longer period of time, okay? Okay, Asma, uh, Fatma, you are right. Differential diagnosis will be pelvic inflammatory disease, irritable bowel syndrome, cystitis. It can be um, just um, endometriosis, of course, it can be there. So these few things, and anybody who's coming with lower abdominal pain, don't forget about the surgical causes of abdominal pain, like appendicitis and uh, some uh, inflammation. Uh, you covered this uh, irritable bowel syndrome or some problem with the uh, bowel so these all will be your differential diagnosis. Any other questions? Very silent members we have today. Yeah, but um, I think uh, the, this topic you've discussed, Dr. Uzma, is a very important one. And uh, most of the... Uh, uh, students should know that this is a hot favorite question, not only for MRCOG exam, but also for RCPI and uh, for all of the exam internationally. So, yeah. Yeah, it's very important. It's because it's a very common topic. And even if you're not sitting for any exam, you should, you know, attend such webinars to refresh your knowledge and upgrade yourself about the, uh, you know, current uh, management of things. Yes, Neelofar, if uh, this endometrioma is there, it depends on patient fertility wishes. Uh, and you can, endometrioma, of course, it needs surgical excision. So you should tell the patient that uh, we will remove this endometrioma. Uh, it will help in uh, relieving your symptoms. And if you wish to get pregnant in future, that will also help uh, by removing this endometrioma. Okay, okay. Nilofar? Asalaamu Alaikum, Dr. Uzma. Wa Alaikum Asalaam, how are you? Alhamdulillah, fine. And I hope you are also doing well. Yes, yes, I'm very fine. And I hope that now we will hear the good news from the, all of you. Inshallah, inshallah. Just I had confusion that if the patient uh, like this scenario patient is with endometrioma, we will directly advise uh, her to go for surgery or uh, we will first try this medical treatment? No, Nilo, uh, as I told you, uh, as I told Fatma also, uh, for the option for this patient is surgical management, but you don't go directly. You have to, you know, uh, speak in a very political way to make the examiner understand that you know all the, uh, how to treat the endometriosis, one, two, three, four, five. So you will say that since you are already taking uh, analgesia, it is not helping you. There is an option of oral contraceptive pills, but since you want to get uh, pregnant, so these pills will not allow you to get pregnant. So the best option for you in this case is to go for a surgical option. That is laparoscopy and we will remove the cyst. This is how you will answer. Now it is clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, welcome, Nilo. Any other question or we will end our session? Okay, so Dr. Uzma, uh, uh, tell them that uh, this question might come as a simple uh, start from the laparoscopic station also, because uh, um, I, rem I remember that there was a station uh, when I was appearing for the American board. So uh, this might come in the RCPI because these international examinations are actually interlinked and these questions being exchanged in between each other. 
So uh, there might be a question that may be linked from uh, such case and the examiner might take you towards the laparoscopic management and may ask you regarding the options uh, like Luna and also the uh, presacral neurectomy. So you need to mention that there is no role recently for all these things, uh, but uh, Luna can, uh, you know, there's some, data, some evidence that it needs some surgical, you know, expertise involving, uh, you know, laparoscopic surgeons. Uh, to deal with this problem. And this only suits when the, there's been, you know, all the options which has been worked and not actually coming out and making relief for the patient. So usually these kinds of surgical treatment can be discussed. Uh, you see, Asma, what I feel, these all questions are subspeciality level, which the exam is not about. So it's good to know more, but uh, you have to know first the basic things, which is at your level and then go to the next things because if it is an interlinked station what happens is there are things um, sometimes if they go for laparoscopy what like uh, one of the station in this mrcpi exam our time was uh, about a young girl who is like i think 26 27 years old who wants to get a sterilization as a contraception so in that one you had to cover the long acting reversible methods uh, and then they jump to the laparoscopy and then they ask laparoscopy complications, uh, mode of uh, entry and what can happen and what cannot happen, you know, everything about laparoscopy. So this type of station they can ask, but this uh, current, uh, this endometriosis, which came as a long case in this uh, March exam, they did not ask anything about laparoscopy details because I think this is beyond the level of specialist. Uh, if you go to subspeciality level, then you know, they will they might ask or some crack examiner will be there and they can be asking stupid questions but this is not the level yeah but if the you know this exam question has been asked and if such question is asked so i think uh, we should give this answer in such a manner okay <clears throat> so uh, anything else who's there Okay, this is over. Excuse me, ma'am. After yeah, this, after this hysterectomy and the tubal uh, patency test, how? What are the fertility options for her? She should go for in IVF, ma'am. Yeah, the best option for her, Doctor Manikam, it is IVF. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome, Doctor Manikam, and thank you for always being there and being very proactive in our group discussions. I really appreciate your efforts. Yeah, the cat Thank you so much, ma'am. Welcome, and uh, it was a wonderful session by Dr. Uzma and uh, all the candidates participated. But we encourage you all guys to participate more because we've been arranging these free sessions for you guys so that you participate well and uh, get yourself evaluated. Okay, since we don't have any more questions, I think we'll end the session. Thank you everyone for joining in and participating in our discussion. And uh, regarding our MRCPI OSCE, we will be uh, offering a short, uh, you can say course for the May people. If the people uh, in here are potential candidates for the May exam, they can contact our med exam team and then we'll give you the <clears throat> details of the course. And thank you once again, Dr. Asman, med exam team, and everybody to join in and, uh, you know, having this fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.